the book of Galatians, and uh, the last couple of weeks we've been looking at the topic of legalism, license, and uh, Christian liberty. And this morning it's our desire now to put together some very uh, practical ways in which we can uh, look at this uh, continuum of legalism, license, and Christian liberty. Let me put this little overhead up here to just uh, kind of summarize what we've been talking about. There's a continuum, Paul says, in the Christian life. On the far left, uh, or far uh, left, there is the idea of license. That's the abuse of Christian grace, Christian faith, Christian mercy, Christian forgiveness. And uh, license happens when the flesh takes an opportunity to cause us to sin because we take for granted the forgiveness and the grace of God. And this is brought about primarily through an attitude of self-indulgence. You say to yourself, hey, I'm forgiven. I'm set free. I'm eternally safe, and you allow that kind of attitude to take a grip upon your heart, and you commit sin, or you carry out behavior that otherwise you know would be wrong. On the left side is the law, and that is the realm of legalism, and I've chosen a judge to uh, represent this because a person who falls into legalism has a tendency to be very self-righteous and they will constantly be judging others more than themselves. And it creates a very uh, critical kind of backbiting environment of extra-biblical rules that do nothing but impede and hurt the spiritual life. And lo and behold, the law can take opportunity through the person's life to create this kind of self-righteous lifestyle. And it's very, very frustrating. Now, in the middle is Christian liberty. And the Bible is our ultimate goal. And Christian liberty is known by its sacrificial love. And that's what we're going to see today as we do a brief survey of Romans chapter 14 verses 1 through chapter 15, as we try to set the stage for how do we keep the balance between legalism and license? How do we keep the balance so that we maintain our Christian liberty and we make the right kinds of decisions? So open up your Bibles with me, if you will, to... Romans chapter 14. Now, there are a couple of problems here in Romans chapter 14 that are not necessarily uh, common problems to us today. But the principles can still apply. And in Romans chapter 14, verse 1, through chapter 15, verse 13, Paul argues that Christians should have mutual respect for each other so that they might glorify God in unity. You see, there's no problem. In fact, there's a lot of good about having personal convictions. As we saw before in previous uh, uh, Bible study, you have biblical mandates of thus saith the Lord. You have biblical principles which are implied from Scripture. Then you may have denominational distinctives. You may have church distinctives. You may have business distinctives. You may have family distinctives. And all of those are all right while they belong to you. But when you move beyond biblical mandate and biblical principle to all of the rest, you must let them belong to you and not impose them upon others or allow them to be a basis for judgment of others. And so we must have mutual respect and even tolerance for one another. 
Now, in Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, Paul is going to say that Christians should not judge each other, but show mutual respect for each other's convictions. He says in Romans 14, 1, Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. In uh, the days of Jesus, the Pharisees and the Sadducees loved to bring the quote-unquote weak into their circles. But the purpose was so that they could dominate them, so that they could rule over them, so that they could direct them and tell them what to do. Paul says, accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. Remember the illustration that I've shared a couple times. When Diana and I moved from Michigan down to Dallas to go to Dallas Theological Seminary and joined a very wonderful fellowship of believers there, the fact that we did not participate or partake of alcoholic beverages was looked upon in their eyes as weakness to us. That we did not have the ability to drink a glass of wine to the glory of God. That was our weakness. But you know, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But one of the good things is there was not necessarily a passing of judgment. There was a mutual respect. They felt that they could have a glass of wine to the glory of God. I grew up in a family with an alcoholic grandfather. I grew up in a family where my mother faced that for the majority of her early lifehood. I lived in a family that had that tendency to maybe fall to alcoholism. And so in our family, there was a concern. It was a family concern that we would not participate in those kinds of beverages for fear that we might have that metabolism that would lead to that. We had uncles. I had an uncle die at a very early age because of alcoholism. And so you accept the one who is quote-unquote weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. Verse 2, one man has faith that he may eat all things. This is the person who can go to the country of buffet and buffet their body to the glory of God. They can go and eat everything on the platter. But he who is weak eats vegetables only. Now, the historical context for this particular passage was the meat offered to idols. There were those who became vegetarians simply because they did not want to take the chance of violating kosher laws or eating meat that had been offered to idols because the majority of the meat in the marketplace was that which came from the temples and the temple sacrifices, which in the pagan community were not kosher. We have people today and we have preachers today who say, if you're a really spiritual believer, you will avoid meat. You will avoid pork. You will avoid certain kinds of things. And by doing that, you will be a more spiritual believer. That's nonsense. Everything that is on the earth, if partaken of properly with thanksgiving, can be good for us. Everything in moderation. And to say that one is more spiritual for eating or for not eating is foolishness. Now, I have some friends who think that the Hebrew text, when it talks about cursing the ground, that uh, pop vegetables from the ground. They don't like vegetables at all. They're not vegetable eaters. But that's okay. That's a preference of taste, not spirituality. And so the man who has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. Verse 3, let not him who eats regard with contempt him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has accepted him. Both people, it's okay in their personal convictions. As long as they don't impose them upon other people, as long as they don't think those standards make them more spiritual, and as long as they don't judge other people less because they don't do what they do. And so there's got to be this mutual acceptance. Now, why? Verse 4. And this is a very uh, straightforward exhortation, even rebuke, when Paul says, who are you to judge 
the servant of another. And that's what we do. Who are we to judge each other in these matters of personal conviction? We're nobody. Who judges? To his own master, that is the Lord, he stands or falls. And stand he will, for the Lord is able to make him stand. The Lord will see us through these things. The Lord will continue to guide and direct us and teach us and help us through these areas. Verse 5. One man regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Let each man be fully convinced in his own mind. There was a bit of a Sabbath controversy there. The Jewish people, their tendency was to maintain the Shabbat, the seventh day of Saturday. The Gentile people and the Christians began to worship on the first day of the week, for that was the day of the resurrection. And so there was controversy, just like we have today, Seventh-day Adventists and others. You've got to worship on Saturday. Well, no, no, you've got to worship on Sunday. Guess what? You can worship on Monday. You can worship at night as much as in the morning. I've heard stories of missionaries who went over on the foreign field and insisted that the tribal groups who came to the Lord had to worship on the first day of the week. You know, that was a great big problem. The first day of the week was market day. And to do that was to throw away their family and to throw away their business. There was nothing wrong with worshiping on the seventh day or the sixth day or the fifth day. We cannot impose those things. But if a person observes a particularly special day, that's all right. Verse 6, he who observes the day observes it for the Lord. And he who eats does it for the Lord. For he gives thanks to God and he gives thanks to Uh, and, And he who eats for the Lord, he does not eat, but he gives thanks to God. So whether you eat or you don't eat, it matters of are you giving thanks to the Lord? That is what is important. Now, we have, quote unquote, Messianic Jews, and they like to continue to celebrate all of the days of the Old Testament calendar, all of the feasts and all of the celebrations. There's nothing wrong with that as long as they don't think it makes them more spiritual or makes them righteous. But it's a wonderful thing. And as I mentioned before, I think it'd be a nice thing for us as a church to take one year sometime and just go through the entire calendar of the Old Testament feasts and celebrations and just do those as a group to remember Christ's sacrifice, to remember the significance and the teaching of it all. But if someone chooses to observe those days... It's perfectly okay. If someone chooses not to, it's perfectly okay. The very first set of questions that was asked to me in my first pastorate were these. Pastor John, what do you think about Christmas trees? Pastor John, what do you think about Christmas carols? Pastor John, what do you think about Christmas gifts? (laughs) That was a big, big issue with the previous pastor. My attitude was... My answer was, well, what do you think? (laughs) What do you think? You know, if somebody wants a tree and somebody wants a tree, that's okay. If somebody wants to exchange gifts and somebody else doesn't want to, that's okay. Now, I'll probably be over at the gift exchange people (laughs) rather than the non-gift people. But that's strictly out of dedication, (laughs) not out of desire. And and so these things are completely wide open as to what you want to do. There may be greater wisdom in one than the other, but the greater wisdom is not to be enforced upon each other. It may be shared. We should always be open to discussion. Verse 7, For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself, speaking of believers. For if we live, we are to live for the Lord, and if we die, we are to die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, from birth to death, we are the Lord's. Verse 9, For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. But you, and you can almost maybe hear Paul's frustration here when he says this, but you, why, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? You see, the one who has complete liberty is judging the other one. The one who is weak is holding the other one in contempt. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, 
and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, Paul says, the bottom line is this. Each one of us shall give an account of himself to God. We are responsible for our own spiritual lives. Yes, God has given us pastors and teachers and deacons and trustees and elders, whatever the churches call them, to try to guide and direct us. But when you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not going to be able to say, but, 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 but my pastor, but, 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 but my elders, but, but, but my deacons, but, but this, but, hey, there's going to be none of that. We are all going to stand before Jesus Christ and give an account for our own personal spiritual lives. How have we maintained them? How have we developed them? What have we done with our life? That is what Paul wants us to think about. Not putting others before us, but thinking about putting ourselves before the Lord. Now, in verses 13 through 15, Paul is going to tell us that a Christian should not cause his brother to sin by violating the brother's conscience or convictions. 14, chapter 14, verses 13 through 15. He says, Therefore, let us not judge one another, but rather determine this, not to put an object, an obstacle, or a stumbling block in a brother's way. Now, I want to define this stumbling block without going into too much detail. But a stumbling block needs to be something that sincerely and significantly impacts the person's faith and walk with the Lord. Because we're going to come across people that are just plain critical. And they're going to be critical. And you can't satisfy them and you can't meet their demands and they'll give you one list and then they'll have another list. And you just have to ask yourself, how is this impacting their faith? How is it impacting their walk with the Lord? Because these things can go too far. The obstacle of stumbling is a serious faith issue. Verse 14, he says, I know and I am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who thinks anything is unclean, to him it is unclean. Our conscience, the conscience of the weaker person, it does become unclean. Verse 15, for if because of food, that is the, in this historical context, the meat offered to idols, your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. What is love? Love is seeking the will of God in the object of and that's what we have to do. We have to think and say to ourselves, how is this impacting my brother or my sister in Christ and their walk with the Lord? And am I being loving? I remember a number of years ago, I was asked to come and speak to a Christian school. And I hadn't done my homework ahead of time as much to find out what kind of a Christian school this was. And on the way over, I realized that I was going to a particular school to speak that had standards like the length of your hair and all of those kinds of things. And uh, I kind of looked as I was driving along to see if there was a barber shop, if I could somehow shoot in and maybe get a quick cut before I got in there. But uh, what I did choose to do was I, I, and in the past I've had long hair, I've had short hair, but thankfully I've had hair. And uh, uh, what I did is I took all my hair and I made sure that I tucked it behind my ears, and that was the main standard, and I pulled it all together as best I could. And when I walked in there, sure enough, that was one of the standards. And I got by. I gave my lesson, and I presented the truth, and uh, hopefully they heard me. But you know what? If I'd have allowed my hair to flop all over my ears, they would have been turned off right away, unfortunately. We, we just have to be sensitive to one another in these kinds of issues. We must walk according to love. He says, do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. For us today, this is not a major issue in the United States, but in countries throughout the world, in Asia, in Central America, South America, and other places, food offered to idols is still very, very common day and these issues are very directly applicable to them. For us, it's the principle. Are you walking according to love? Verse 16, Therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. 
For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. You wouldn't know that amongst Baptists. So hard to have the kingdom of God without food and fellowship. But righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what it is. It's spiritual things, not physical things. For he who in this way serves Christ, serves in a loving way, in a caring way, in a sacrificial way, is going to be acceptable to God and approved by men. Do you want to find the way to please God and to please men? Walk by love. Walk sacrificially. Walk sensitively. Verse 19. So then, let us not pursue the things which make for peace. So then, let us pursue the things that make for peace and the building up of one another. Verse 20. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. If somebody has a conscience problem about a particular issue, then you need to limit yourself in that particular area. Now, one area that I faced uh, years ago was my uh, hobby of outdoorsmanship. Uh, when you get a chance to come and visit my office, you will see that I'm an outdoorsman. I have some fish, I have some animals, uh, yes, I've eaten them, uh, and uh, that's what I do. I love to hunt and fish. But years ago, I was involved in a Bible study with some people that I'd led to the Lord, and I happened to say to them, we won't be able to have a Bible study uh, next week, because the Michigan holiday of November 15th is coming up, and I'll be gone. Now, they didn't understand the Michigan holiday of November 15th, because they were not into any kind of hunting at all. November 15th is the beginning of gun season for the harvesting. Notice that politically correct word, the harvesting of uh, animals. Now, I understand that there are some people who are absolutely opposed to that, and these folks were absolutely shocked when they heard I was an outdoorsman. And I didn't see the reaction completely until later. And I had to come to a point for a period of time where I no longer did any hunting or fishing because it genuinely bothered their minds and their faith. And it was a stumbling block. And I just said, hey, for the sake of these uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, I will let this go and pray. And pray I did. And a few months later, they turned around and they said, you know what, we've been doing some reading in the newspaper and so on and so forth, and uh, we realize that there is a, a certain sportsmanship to it. There's a certain uh, aspect of the commandment in the Bible that we are to uh, kill and to eat. We understand that you uh, uh, truly do eat uh, what you take and that that's part of the economy for you and your family. And uh, I was permitted to do that again. But these are the kinds of things that you can get into at times. And I'm sure that you have some in your own mind that you're thinking about. But Paul says in verse 20, Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food, or hunting, or uh, recreational sports, or whatever you're involved in. Verse 20, All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the one who eats and gives offense. Verse 21, It is good not to eat meat, or to drink wine, or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. And so we need to have a sensitivity. There are biblical mandates. There are biblical principles. There are institutional principles. There are church principles. There are church principles, or family principles. There are individual principles. And as believers, we just need to be sensitive to all of that at times. And we limit our behavior. Hopefully we can enter into dialogue and discussion and maybe education. And they can come to a point where they either appreciate or allow or tolerate what we do, or they might even be able to move along out of a position of what could be weakness. But we have to let uh, the faith of the other, verse 22, reign. The faith which you have has as your own conviction. There are personal convictions before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. It's a wonderful thing to go about life and not have your conscience bothering you. 
I do know that there are some people who have overactive consciences. They are too introspective. They, are, they, they were brought up maybe in a perfectionistic kind of, of uh, family or perfectionistic kind. And I'm, I'm, you know, every high school student and junior high school student out there is saying to themselves, yeah, that's where I live, man. That's where I live. No, no, no. That's not where you live. Uh, perfectionism and all those kinds of things where, you know, there is just all these kinds of rules and a constant uh, uh, criticism for unrelated issues. And what happens? You just get too sensitive a conscience, too introspective. You're always judging yourself, and that makes for a miserable life. He says, the faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. Verse 23, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats. You can't violate your conscience. You shouldn't violate your conscience until you work through it biblically and spiritually. Because his eating is not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin. If we can't do it in faith, in thanksgiving, to the glory of God, then it is sin to us. Not to you, not to you, but to me and me only. Now, in verses 15, chapter 15, verses 1 through 6, Paul is going to bring in a third person. We've seen the weak person. We've seen the uh, maybe strong person. Uh, who's strong in conscience, in verse 15, I'm going to designate this person the mighty person. Now, the New American Standard Translation uses the word strong, but when you see the word strong, think about the word mighty. Romans 15, 1. Now, we who are mighty ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Let each of us, that is the mighty, Please his neighbor for his good to his edification. You see, you have the weak person who has conscience problems. You have the strong person who knows biblically and is right with conscience. But then you got the mighty person who, because of love for the weak, will limit, restrict their behavior for the love and the edification and the good pleasure of the weak person. And that's the person in chapter 15, verse 1. Now, we who are mighty ought to bear, we are under obligation to bear the weaknesses of those without strength. (coughs) Excuse me, and not just please ourselves. See, the pleasers, the self-pleasers, fall into the license, self-indulgence. Not just please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproach thee fell upon me. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, that through perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. All of the scriptures are there to give us the biblical mandates, to give us the biblical principles, so that we might have the encouragement and the hope. Discussion must focus on the scriptures. If you're going to bring up an issue like drinking or like certain kinds of entertainment or uh, certain kinds of hobbies or activities, the scriptures must be the basis of the discussion in the context of biblical mandates and implied principles. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction that through perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. Now, may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you what? To be of the same mind. Does to be of the same mind mean to think the same thing? No. Does it mean you're going to agree on the same thing and then everybody's all of a sudden going to be outdoorsmen or not outdoorsmen? Everybody's going to drink wine to the glory of God? Everybody's not? Some people are going to buffet their bodies and others aren't? You know, what, what, where is the principle here? What does it mean when it means that you're going to be of the same mind? It doesn't mean total agreement, but it, what it means is a commitment to unity for the glory of God. Now, may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. That 
with one accord, you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the same mind. That whatever decision I make, I'm going to glorify God. And I'm going to, in unity, praise him with others. That is the desire and the direction. Now, how do we put this into very, very practical terminology? Well, let me suggest to you, with this overhead, and if you're taking notes, you may want to take a piece of paper and divide it into four boxes, and in the middle, just put this little thing called the decision box. And I'm going to suggest to you that there are, in summary, four basic philosophies by which people approach life issues, all right? And uh, one of the approaches that people take, and they live in what we call the social court. Can we uh, see that? I'll move it up here. They live in the social court. When they're going to make a decision about doing something, the main thing that they say to themselves, well, is everybody else doing it? If everybody else is doing it, then I'm going to do it. You know, um, these are the people that respond uh, to the polls. You know, what do you think about the president? What do you think about this? What do you think about that? And they'll say, well, if everybody else is doing it, then it's okay. You know, if everybody else is immoral, then it's all right, you know, for leaders to be immoral. If everybody else is lying, well, then it's all right for leaders to lie. And, and uh, uh, students love this one. I mean, how many times have we as parents heard this one? Well, everybody else is doing it. Everybody else is going like majority rules. And so there's the social court. There's the social court. Um, now, there's other people. Uh, they live in this court. They live in the physical court. And all they're going to ask themselves is the question, does it feel good? You know, is this pleasurable to me? If it's pleasurable to me, I don't care what it means to other people. Uh, this is where I live, and uh, I'm just going to have a good time. And it all focuses on me, the physical court. Now, there's a third court where some people live. And that's called the moral court. And in the moral court, these people are a little more upstanding, maybe. At least they think they are. And they simply ask themselves this question. Is there a law against it? If there's no law against it, then it's okay. It doesn't matter if it's ethical. You know, you can be legally correct in your definition, uh, and that's okay. But maybe not ethically or morally correct. And so in the moral court, you say, is there a law against it? You know, I don't care if I'm hurting somebody. I don't care if I'm out maneuvering somebody in a business deal. I mean, that's just, it's dog eat dog as long as I'm not violating the law. And that's all I care about. Now, there's other people. Uh, they live in the spiritual court. And may I say this? When we work the decision box, you can only pick one of the courts. You've got to live in one court at a time. Now, there are other people. They live in the spiritual court. In other words, they ask themselves... 1 Corinthians 10.31, will I glorify God by this activity? 1 Thessalonians 5.18, and everything give thanks. This is the will of God. Can I thank God? Uh, 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Would Jesus do this? Or Colossians 3.17, will I be a good witness? Be ready always to give a defense a reason for the hope that is within you. And so our world lives in different boxes, but which one do you and I live in? Now, let's put this to the test for just a couple examples. Let's say, for instance, uh, Decision Box. We're going to go to the movies tonight. What movie should we go see? Oh, well, I want to go see such and such a movie. Well, it's rated R, okay? Social court decision. Is everybody doing it? Well, man, absolutely. Absolutely. Everybody's going to this movie, and, and, and I'm going to go to this movie because everybody else is going, even though it's rated R, for whatever reason. In the physical court, does it feel good? Well, you'd say to yourself, well, uh, yeah, it's rated R, but what's the genre of the movie? I mean, if it's violence and I don't like violence, then I'm not going to go. If it's violence and I do like violence, then I'm going. Or whatever it is. Maybe it's a romantic comedy. I don't like 
you know, maybe it's a musical. Oh, gosh. You know, not going to go to a musical. Hate musicals. Uh, the moral law. Is there a law against it? All right, it's R-rated, which means what? That you've got to be 17. So, anybody less than that would say, nope, not going to go to it because it would violate the law. So, if I'm below 17, I'm not going to go to that movie. Uh, the spiritual court. You would look at that movie and say, well, will I glorify God by watching this movie? Can I thank God when the movie's over for the contents that I've seen? Uh, would Jesus go to this movie? Will I be a good witness by walking into this movie? Okay. How, how do those questions impact your decision? What, what about if it was PG-13? It changes in the moral court, but not the physical court or the social court. Now, we could take you know, some other kinds of examples here in the sense of, uh, of uh, alcohol. You, know, you could say, all right, I'm going to you know, a party or a wedding, and there's alcohol going to be there. Uh, social court, is everybody else doing it? Does it feel good? Some people would say, yeah, you know, I get a nice buzz. Other people would say, oh, man, I get so sick. You know? Uh, is there a law against it? Well, yeah, there would be various laws that would impact it. But then you have to ask yourself the question in the spiritual court. Will I glorify God? Can I thank God? Would Jesus do this? Will I be a good witness? Now, this is not necessarily, I'd like to suggest, outlaw alcohol. Because you may be in a context, as uh, I found myself at one time, being when we were living in Israel, I was invited over to the home of uh, some Arab Christians, and they would have these tiny little uh, cups of wine, which were, uh, you know, a great honor to the guest. And to not take a sip of that or not to have some of that was very offensive to them. And so missionaries and others sometimes find themselves in situations where you don't have time to explain your personal convictions <coughs> and go into a big theology you're trying to build bridges with these people. And, and to sip or whatever, a small glass isn't going to kill you, and it's not going to kill them necessarily. But you know what? It's up to you to make that decision. But you have to be sensitive to all those areas. There are many biblical tests that we can put into this spiritual court. And I have you know uh, a whole list of about 20 different tests uh, like the compass test, does this draw me closer to God or farther away? The logic test, does this make good sense? The universal test, what would the world be like if everyone did this? The blessing test, will I be seeking the good of others? The stewardship test, will this be a good use of my resources? And I'll make these available for you. But I think the main decision this morning is this, where are you living? In what court are you living? We have to find a balance between license and legalism so that we live our Christian liberty. And the only place you can exercise your Christian liberty is in the spiritual court. The social court isn't going to guide you spiritually. Sometimes you'll make an okay decision, but that's only if majority is right. And that doesn't happen very often. The physical court, chances are, <laughs> you may make some good decisions, but you're going to make a lot of bad decisions. The moral court, hey, to just live by the law is just very frustrating, and it's not loving to others. So we have to learn to live in the spiritual court, asking ourselves constantly the questions. Will I glorify God? Can I thank God? Would Jesus do this? Will I be a good witness? That's where we want to live. That's where I hope you'll want to live. Now, my suggestion is that uh, you take something like this and just put it up on the refrigerator of your house. And when you make family decisions or when your children come to you and say, I want to do this or that, you just walk over to the little chart and you say, well, let's put the thought into the decision box and see where we're going to make our decision. And hopefully you'll move into the spiritual court and you'll make the right decision. Um, I can uh, make uh, 11 by 17 uh, laminated uh, pictures of this for 19.95 and make them available uh, in the future.
for those uh, young people who would like to buy one of these. So, all right, uh, Bruce, come and.